Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. Turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 12. It's kind of nice to uh, wake up a little later today, right? Happy Thursday at noon. It's a cool 10 a.m. service. We're going to get a few more hours of sleep. Here in Romans chapter 12, looking at verse 11, the Bible reads, Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, they said that his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Wow. It was just booming when you heard Jesus speak. Come on. When Jesus was speaking to you, there was no, it was unmistakable that you knew he was the Son of God. Wow. He spoke with authority, he spoke with power. Jesus, he one of these things that he said, one of the quotes he said is, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How did he not say that with zeal? Jesus at one point turned to the crowd. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yet even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. He said that with zeal. Come on. Another time he answered, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Unless they are born of water and the spirit, you should not be surprised by saying, you must be born again. Right. Another time, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and others sitting at the table exchanging money. So he made a whip out of course and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Mm -hmm. He walked into God's temple and just saw it as a marketplace. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Come on. Stop turning my brother's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Amen. Jesus spoke with such fervor that the only thing that the disciples could Think about was that reminds me of a, of a passage in the Bible. Yeah. That zeal will consume. Jesus was a man of great zeal. Yeah. Zealous in his pursuit of his cause, zealous in God's purpose. In Colossians 1 it says, Jesus is the head of the body, God's church. If he is leading us and he is zealous, then where should we be? Amen. We should be zealous too. I believe that is one thing our church should never lack. Come on. Zeal. Come on. Come on, Dale. What is zeal? Great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause. It consumes, it absorbs all the attention and energy of to completely destroy, to eat up, to use up, to devour. When I think of devour, I think of like a, a lion. I can imagine a lion kind of strolls into the room with like a prey, some prey in its mouth. Mm. And he just sits there. And it just starts just chewing on its foot. There's nothing left but just bones after it. Like that's that's devouring. That's how, that's how much zeal should be in us. That it just devours us. How zealous are you this morning? Come on, this afternoon. But what about zeal in Christianity? What does that look like? Being a Christian and being a zealous person in Christianity. Well, it's a person of one thing. This person only sees one thing. They care for one thing. They live for one thing. They are swallowed up by one thing. And that one thing is to please God. Whether they live, whether they die, whether they are healthy, whether they are sick, whether they are rich, whether they are poor, whether they please man or whether they give offense, whether they have thought wise or whether they have thought foolish, whether they are accused or whether they are praised, whether they get honored, whether they get shamed, for this, all this, a zealous person cares nothing at all but to please God. Yeah. Come on. Come on, bro. They have a passion for one thing. And that one thing is to please God and to advance God's glory. Are you zealous? If they are consumed in the very burning of their passion for God, they don't care. They are content. They feel that, like a candle, they were made to burn. Mm. Mm. Wow. Come on, brother. Come on, Dale. Good point. Made to burn. 
Yeah. And if they are consumed in the burning, then they have only done the work for which God has done. Zeal, as a Christian is the title of it. Come on, bro. Does this describe you? Are you zealous? Do you just feel consumed by God? Are you consumed with your life? Are you consumed with the worries of this world? Are you consumed with just your family or relationship or drug or alcohol? Come on, bro. What are you consumed by? Because there is one thing. You are consumed by something. Amen. Maybe it's Netflix. <laughs> I mean, I, I love watching Netflix. And it used to consume my life. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd watch, watch series upon series of different shows on Netflix. And it would consume my life. Yeah. What's consuming you? I think in this church, we need more zeal in our unity. Come on, bro. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I have a shorter lesson for you guys today. Come on down. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In the, the Corinth church, it was a mess. The Corinth church was a mess. They're often called the troubled church. They just have a lot of stuff just going on, a lot of troubles going on in their life. Uh, I mean, it was stuff from like improper sexual behavior. I mean, they were committing incest with one another. Man was sleeping with his father's wife, so on and so forth. They were sacrificing meat to idols. Different troubles. They were denying even the doctrine of resurrection. People were following man instead of just simply following God. It was a troubled church. And as a troubled church, as you can see why Peter wrote two nice, very long letters to the Corinth church. But here in the first letter, just ten verses down, in the very first chapter, Paul writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just huge right there. You know, like, I appeal to you in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, it's not, like, James came up to me and said, hey, bro, like, can you give me a glass of water? Sure, bro. I'm going to give you a glass of water. But he came up to me and said, hey, bro, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, can you please give me a glass of water? Like, like, what type of water, what flavor of water, what type of water you need, bro? Like, I got you. He appeals to the Corinth church in this way. That all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you. But that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. He wanted them to feel united. He wanted them to be united. In the first ten verses, Paul uses the phrase... Christ Jesus, or Lord Jesus Christ, nine times to get his point across. He calls on the authority of Jesus Christ nine times in just the first ten verses to get them to move their hearts. It was a troubled church. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In your heart today, ask yourself, is there someone in the church that you're not going to be? Like maybe you look in this room and just that one brother or sister just kind of rubs you along the wrong way. Okay. See some of you guys looking around. Like, you got to deal with it. You got to deal with it. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse thirteen. Sorry, verse twelve actually. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, all its parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body. For the Jews, the Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of many parts, of, 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 but of one part, but of many. I guess that's us. We are all different parts, but of the same body. Come on, bro. Some of us might hear me thinking like, yeah, I, I believe that, bro. I believe like, I'm the hand. I'm pretty body. I mean, like, the hand is a lot. I mean, like, hold my Bible with my hand. Like, you know, like, touch things with my hand. But imagine if the hand was severed from the body. Even something as valuable as the hand. What about the eye? Severed from the body. As important as it is to see, if it's not connected to the body, it does not do its job. Come on, bro. Well, how do you know if you're starting to stray away from the body? 
This is how you know. Church becomes a meeting time. It's a meeting. It's just something in your schedule. You're late to it at times because it's just a meeting to you. You feel like you can sever yourself from the body, but it's, it's not that important. Come on, bro. Preach. You got this false doctrine and you saying it's okay to be late. It's all right. Like, I mean, but would you show up to work late over and over and over again and expect to keep your position and your job? No <laughs> and yet you show up to God's kingdom, God's house, and you expect God to just be okay with you showing up late to his kingdom. May your yes be yes, and may your no be no. You made a commitment day one to seek for God's kingdom. Keep your commitment. The reason why you don't want to keep it is because you're undisciplined. You've made a schedule, but then you don't want to keep it. You can show your disciple, you can show a friend of yours, oh, look, look at my schedule. We get your late for this, you're late for that. And then thing after thing, kingdom event after kingdom event, you're late to it. You're not keeping your schedule. Maybe it's just the fact that you're just lazy. You're just lazy. You, you, you hold back from doing what you know is best. That's sin too. Knowing the good you ought to do and not doing it, that's sin. Yeah. Repent of your laziness. How do you know that you've started to detach yourself from the body? Well, your brother or brotherly or sisterly fellowship happens only on Sunday. Throughout the week, you don't make a phone call to anyone in the church. You don't ask to hang out with anybody. No one comes over to your place. You don't go to their place. In fact, maybe even your deed time doesn't happen. Your discipling time doesn't happen. Unless they make the phone. You're better friends with people in the world than you are with friends in the kingdom. You get bad attitudes with people that are trying to help you in your relationship with God than people that are trying to drag you away to sin. Bad company corrupts good character. Who is your company this week? Who were you around? Was it God's kingdom? Whoa. What's the world? Another way you might know is that you have something against your brother or sister in this room that you're not willing to forgive. You're starting to <coughs> sever yourself from God's big body, God's kingdom. And you forget, you're stubborn, you forget that you've messed up too. And someone had to forgive you. You would just rather do things your way and not God's way. You think that you can rely on your own understanding and everything's going to be okay? How's that working out for you? Relying on your own understanding and not going to God. Guys, this week was really tough for me. Um, uh, if you don't know, I'm an intern with the church, a uh, campus ministry intern. And uh, um, the, the campus ministry is awesome. It's really, it's really great. There's a lot of people studying the Bible uh, uh, on campus. In fact, this past week, I had 22 Bible studies on campus. 22 Bible studies, not to lift me up, but to lift God. He's really working a, a, a harvest there on that campus. Where I believe we're going to see some fruit here very, very soon. But it was a tough week. Uh, part of which is that you know the campus ministry woke up at 6 a.m. Uh, or 5.30 every morning to be on campus by 6 and pray for an hour for God to move on that campus. From 6 to 7 every day, Monday through, uh, through Friday, we're there on that campus praying to God. But it was tiring. Yeah. It was hard. And as the intern, the expectation is, I'm on campus at least until 10 p.m. Yeah. Wow. So I pray, I go to campus at 6, pray till 7. I then would go home for about an hour. And that's when I read my Bible from about 7.30 to about 8.30. Then I would hop in the shower, get ready for my day, and it's about 9. And I catch the, the shuttle to campus at 9.22. So I hop in the shuttle at 9.22. and gets into the campus about 9.50. Bible talk starts at 10. We're sharing our faith from 10 to 12. Bible talk 12 to 12.15. Bible study at 12.30. Bible study at 1.30. Bible study at 2.30. Bible study at 3.30. A double Bible study at 4.30. Bible study at 5.30. A break. I get to eat for an hour. Thank the Lord. And then Bible study at 6.30. Bible study at 7.30. And then 
Bible talk again at 8, 815. And then I might have a little break to kind of relax. Kind of. And then, good news sharing within the campus ministry starting at 9. And that would go for about an hour to about 10. And then we'd go. I leave a family time at my house. So sometimes I go home and I leave family time from 10 to 11, 11.30. Had a couple of Bible studies that started at 11, so that would go past 12. Wow. I wouldn't get to bed sometimes until 12.30 or 1 in the morning. Yeah. And then wake up the next day about 5.30 to get campus. Yeah. <laughs> and this week in particular, wow. as an intern being trained to do the ministry and ministry work, I got a lot of stuff thrown my way, a lot of stuff to do and a lot of stuff to take care of. And <laughs> it's sad to say that I wasn't able to get everything. Because that's the expectation. Excellence. You get everything done. You, you, just, you find a way to make it happen. But this week, I, I, I did not. That fell short. I wanted to start my lesson, today's lesson, days ago. But I get home, and I, I, I get through done the studies, and leave family time, or you know, after midweek, or whatever. I get home, and, and it's 12.30 at night, and I might get like one bite to eat. Hot dog in the fridge, like going for a hot dog, and then I'm out cold. I was done. I was just so exhausted. And now I'll put it off. Tuesday, put it off. Wednesday, put it off. Thursday, put it off. Friday. Because I would just go to bed, just dog topping, and just want to sleep. The bulletin. I was supposed to write the bulletin article. I got it done. But I made a mistake. If you look on the back of the bulletin, uh, the 15 that they are here in the room, look on the back of the bulletin, there's a little mistake down there. Uh, the contribution number is supposed to be written out per week, and there's today's week that's actually supposed to reflect last week's numbers. There's two of the same numbers on there from, from two weeks. I, I, I made a mistake. The bulletin's not excellent. I didn't finish the bulletin or bulletin article until last night. And then um, Mike C said he's reading, uh, he's, he's uh, leading the um, Maryland House Church. He had his bulletin article to write, and I was supposed to throw that into the bulletin kind of template that we have and give it to him as well. So I was kind of working on like two bulletins last night. I got his done and printed it up for his, but not for me. I ran out of paper. That's, part, that's the reason why we only have 15 bulletins, because I ran out of paper. And um, right now I have $5 in my bank account. I have to pay in contribution today. And I'll have enough money to buy more paper. Last night, I was supposed to get my lesson done. And uh, I like the way it started off with the zeal. But what you just heard right there, that's the end of it. That's the end of my lesson. That's as far as I got. I was working on my lesson last night while trying to babysit for Richie's kids because he's out of town. And um, I was there late enough, and, 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 and so late that um, when Santana came over to uh, help, help watch the kids and someone else was there, I didn't want to stay there when the sister's too much too late for purity reasons. Yeah. And so I left and went home. But I got home probably about 12.30 at night. Stayed up for a little bit, another about an hour. Was sitting on the, on the couch with my laptop in front of me and fell asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Woke up about 4.30. Lost about three hours there. I didn't finish my lesson. The, um, I went back, I, you know, I, I worked hard on my lesson and a couple other things I needed to do. Went back to reach out to print everything out, and the printer wasn't working. So I wasn't able to print my lesson. Even what I did have here. Simon uh, Guteng had to go to his office right here on campus and print my lesson for me. Because the, the printer wouldn't work. Go Sitting there and Simon. Return and, yeah, it's just not Go Dale and Simon. Yeah. Um, if you haven't noticed, I couldn't find my dress shoes this morning. Thank the Lord, they've met. I live in a household of uh, uh, ten other brothers. Sorry, nine other brothers, ten total. And I have two pairs of dress shoes. So I'm not sure where to find one pair, right? I lent one of my dress shoes to a brother uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, I asked him, hey, bro, like, I can't find my dress shoes. Do you mind if I take the ones back that I lent you? He said, bro, I can't find them either. <laughs> I said, like, hey, man, bro, at least it's house church. Maybe this is my casual dress for this day. <laughs> um, if you've met with the Dunlop kids, 
Uh, I babysat for them all, almost uh, the majority of the day yesterday. Because again, Richie and Elizabeth are out of town. They're a handful. <laughs> they, they, they are, I love the death. I love Lucy. I love Sawyer. But they're bouncing off the walls. Like, two and one years old. You know, like, they need constant attention. So there's, there's no room to get anything done for today while I was babysitting them. Um, as I was thinking, really, like, this morning about all that was happening and, like, all that was, like, transpiring, I was like, man, this... This is terrible. Like, I'm having a really bad, like, 24 hours here. Like, things are just not happening. Things are not getting done. Like, as much as I want to get stuff done, it's just not happening. I was like, the only thing that makes this worse is like, I don't know. We got in, like, a car accident. So this morning, as me and Santana are backing out of the driveway of Richie's house, we get into a car accident. This morning. We're backing up, and literally, both me and Santana both look behind us to make sure no one's there. And then it was like Satan just placed like a car, just, just yeah. from, Whoa. like, out of nowhere. Yeah. We're backing up, and I was like, what? I'm like, what? What was that? I look behind me, and it's some lady in the, in the, in the, in the, in the driver's seat just looking at us like, you were. <laughs> <laughs> like, we weren't going fast, like, no one was hurt, like, it was, you know, it was a bad accident. But it was like a little fender bender, and like no honk from her, like nothing, just looking at us like, yeah, you just hit me. <laughs> we step out of the car, and I'm, really, I'm literally thinking, I can't believe this is happening. It's, it's like 10.50, and I'm supposed to be here at 11. Uh, we, you know, we, we live of our, we're, we're driving about 20 minutes away. And you walk out of the car, and you look at her, the damage on her car, scratched by this thing. And I'm looking at her like, oh, she's, she's doing fine, we need Get back in the car, it's okay, it's not that bad. And she starts bombarding Santana with questions about, hey, can I get your uh, my insurance? Can I get your uh, uh, driver's license? And hey, man, like, I understand. I don't scratch with this thing. <laughs> I'm like, this is exactly what I didn't want to happen this morning. And so we got into a car accident. But all this, and I was very tempted to let this rock my face. Yeah. You know, with not getting everything done, I, I really, I, I felt ashamed, I felt embarrassed, I still feel a little embarrassed. But I'm up here preaching, and I, I don't have much prepared from you guys, from God, um, and I'm sincerely sorry. So about you. Come on, Dale. Come on, I really wanted to um, we'll love you, Dale. Yeah. honor God in this way, to, to, to help the family, help you guys, and I, and I feel like I failed. Sure and it was not. very easy for me to not remember my lesson from a couple weeks ago about how I preached that failure is an event and not a person. Yeah. Come on, yeah. And in my flesh, what I wanted to do was take that and go, man, I'm a failure. Look at Surely all the things not. that I just failed at. Surely not. And so, you know, I came here and I was pretty down. Yeah. I was pretty down. I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And uh, Jack pulled me aside and said, hey, bro, how are you doing? I said, bro, oh, I'm doing terrible. I'm doing horrible. He said, okay, bro, what's up? I told him what was going on. And he encouraged me with my own lesson I preached a couple weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I should probably do that. <laughs> he said, bro, whatever the case, just preach your heart. Yeah. And so that's what I'm doing for you guys today. Is that, amen, I'm just giving you guys my heart. Amen, bro. Um, it's, uh, it's humbling, but I, I know this is something that's going to make me stronger and better. Yeah. Um, and, and it's something that I want to encourage you guys and to ask yourselves, what do you do in times of failure? Yeah. Yeah. What do you turn to? Yeah. Yeah. What is it that you feel that when you fail, this is what you go to? Is it God or do you crawl into your cave? Self-pity, self-doubt. And it's something that you guys just, you, you start to doubt yourself. So that, that's God's plan for you. What I know for sure is that God is still working. Yes, right. Right. Come on. Come on. Today is just a day. Sure, everything that I could have thought imaginable, even the car accident, happened. <laughs> everything was bad, but it's not the end. It's not the end. Turn to Isaiah chapter 64. Right. Come on, Come on Dad.
Isaiah 64, verse 6. This is kind of how it felt. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are all shriveled up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us over. I felt this just a few hours ago. That all of the Bible studies I've done this week accounted for nothing. I felt like all the, all the work that I put in, all the hard work, some of the sleepless nights I put in, accounted for nothing. And I was tempted to feel that even though those men and those, those people on campus heard the word, that it counted for nothing, but it did not. It did not. Right. We have to remember that God is still in control. Yeah. God is still moving our lives. He's not going to let anything that we do for Him go in there. Come on. Yeah. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm sorry, John 15. John 15. John 15. What's also about our campus ministries that we're called the vine. The vine campus ministries, and it's based off this verse here in John chapter 15. Verse 4. The Bible reads, Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Guys, we have to remember that when we stay in the vine, that's what makes our life. Yeah. Yeah. It's nothing else. When we just stay in the vine, apart from that, we can do no that's thing. Right. Wow. But when we remain in God, that's when we have zeal for God. That's right. Amen. That's when we persevere for God's house. Yep. That's when we don't give up. Yep. When we stay in the vine. What's motivating you to stay in the vine? Is it just a fear of man? Like I can promise you guys, if it was simply just a fear of man, I wouldn't be here. Yep. I wouldn't be still talking if I had a fear of man because of the fear that I have today. Yep. What makes you persevere? My hope for you is that it's God. My hope is that it's, it's nothing else other than God's love and his love for you and your love for him. Last scripture here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Come on, Come on God. Verse 12. Chapter 5, verse 12. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one, one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Wow. Guys, I refuse to let this week crack my faith. Come on, bro. Come on. I refuse to let this week steal my zeal. Come on, bro. I refuse to let this week let me give up. Come on. I hope that you guys refuse to let your bad week, if you had one, steal your joy and your salvation in God. Guys, let's still be zealous for God this week, zealous for God and his kingdom zealous for our salvation, because that's what we have in him. To God be all the glory. I love you guys. Thank you very much. Okay. At this time, we'll have one song. We can all stand up, and then we'll come back. All right, we're going to sing song 214, Go and Make Your Type. Let's all stand up. He said to go to every nation. He said to 